for hopping. Deputy Speaker, thank you very much for this opportunity to make a contribution to this debate. Uh, for those watching at home and in the gallery, I'm rising to make some comments on a bill which has, as been pointed out by some previous speakers, actually a really very limited economic impact. It tidies up the delivery of some of the $900 tax bonuses that were provided by the Labor government to protect Australia during the global financial crisis and ensures that those bonuses can no longer be distributed now that the crisis has been averted. I will talk a little bit more about the specifics of the legislation, but I think it's very important that we place this legislation in its context. And to that end, I want to talk a little bit about Labor's record during the global financial crisis. I actually got to see the global financial crisis unfold firsthand. I was living in Boston uh, throughout uh, 2006 to 2008. And I remember the first time I read about mortgage defaults. It was on the front page of the New York Times, and there was a big story about families down in Florida that were having to put the keys to their household in an envelope and send it back to banks um, because the size of their mortgage had actually exceeded the value of their property. The summer following that, I worked uh, in the global corporate client group at the New York Stock Exchange. And those of you who are keen observers of financial markets will remember that um, during those mid sort of period of the 2000s, we saw a number of uh, big equity firms, um, private equity firms, float on the stock exchange with staggering results. Um, but into that later period of, of the decade, um, uh, we saw them float on the stock market, and there were some there's some early rumblings about what we would later see. Um, flow through those financial markets. It was really the beginning of what would end up being a devastating lack of confidence um, running through markets around the world. At that very time, back in Australia, the Rudd government was putting in place a set of policies that would genuinely, and I mean, really mean this, genuinely come to be the envy of Treasury departments and governments around the world. So what was the package that, that we're really referring to? There were two elements to it. Uh, the first was that the Rudd government spent about $95 billion trying to stimulate eco economic demand in the Australian economy over four carefully timed, carefully constructed waves. It was a mix, mix of household stimulus, and, the, and the, uh, the legislation before us today relates to the distribu distribution of that, that funding, um, and also some investment in shovel-ready projects. So people who have been members of the House for a long time will have enjoyed the experience of going around to open um, BER buildings in all their, their primary schools, and that was, that was part of this funding. Uh, the second element, of course, was the banking deposit guarantees. So the government stepped in to guarantee bank deposits up to a million dollars in financial institutions around the country. This was an enormously bold measure, Deputy Speaker. It allowed those financial institutions the confidence to continue to accessing funding. If that hadn't happened, lending could have collapsed, leading to all sorts of ramifications across the economy. Um, and as consumers, it made us confident uh, that we'd be able to continue to access our, our deposits in those banks. Now, in retrospect, when we describe those measures in the House today, they seem simple, uh, they seem obvious. But I think we need to put ourselves back in, in um, around that period of 2008. Um, and remember that this was actually very controversial at the time. It encountered massive opposition from, from the Liberal Party. Um, watching it up close, I think it's, just, it's, it's, it's easy for us to forget how scary this period was. Uh, I think at one point in time, Goldman Sachs dropped 50 per cent of its market value in a single morning. Um, September 2008, we watched Lehman Brothers, a massive global bank, collapse. 28,000, uh, 26,000 employees, I think it's the largest U.S. company ever to go into default, um, and governments around the world balked at the face of this challenge. It was truly a scary time. Um, the papers were full of economists with wildly varying views about what should be done. Um, but the two measures that were put in place by the Rudd government um, were the primary elements of what was ultimately um, lauded as a brilliant strategy. Um, and we know, of course, that the member for Lilly was named World Finance Minister in 2011. I think what's particularly interesting about this is how unique Australia was in its, in its approach to this. Uh, it's, it's not as though all countries around the world were doing the same thing and Australia was following suit. We were actually the pioneers of this strategy. Uh, it's, uh, these uh, probably sound like big claims, but you don't have to believe me on this. You don't even have to uh, believe our shadow treasurer or other Labor MPs. You can trust um, people who don't have a, a, a stake in this. Um, we've heard a little bit from Joseph Stiglitz, of course, this morning. Um, but you would find really no finer economist, um, and his comments about Australia's reaction to the global financial crisis are pretty well known. Um, Stiglitz, of course, is a, a Nobel Prize winner in economics and a professor of economics at Columbia University. 
Uh, and I'll just go on to quote him here. He said, most countries would envy Australia's economy. During the global recession, Kevin Rudd's government implemented one of the strongest, strongest Keynesian stimulus packages in the world. That package was delivered early with cash grants that could be spent quickly, followed up by longer term investments that buoyed confidence and activity over time. In many other countries, stimulus was too small and arrived too late after jobs and confidence were already lost. Not so in Australia, Deputy Speaker. He goes on to say, in Australia, the stimulus helped avoid a recession and saved up to 200,000 jobs. And new research shows that stimulus may also actually have reduced government debt over time. Australia may have successfully dodged the global crisis, but some politicians seem to have missed the lessons it taught the rest of the world. In this election, referring to the election just previous, the conservative side of politics has foreshadowed substantial cuts to the government budget. This would be a grave mistake, especially now. Labor actually did a fantastic job of saving your country, that's Australia, from problems. So there we have Deputy Speaker Joseph Stiglitz, one of the most famous economists in the world, um, talking with great enthusiasm about um, how the Rudd government responded to the global financial crisis. But we don't just hear it from, um, from Stiglitz. The IMF, of course, has also made, um, made some similar comments. So the IMF has actually singled Australia out as the developed nation furthest ahead of the pack, saying Australia and the new industrialised Asian economies are off to a strong start and will likely stay in the lead. Um, in the report, the IMF country report of August 2011, they referred to the ability of Australia to actually um, create a second budget stimulus package if there was another global economic collapse um, and the, the room that we had to move on interest rates also. I'll just note on, on the side that that report also noted an endorsement of Labor's carbon price policy. So one not, uh, need not wonder what the IMF would report about the Coalition's direct action plan once the details uh, will be revealed five months after an election. We still know very little about this. The cynics amongst us might wonder whether the government does either. Time will tell on that one. Um, so we've heard from Stiglitz, we've heard from the IMF. Uh, we also um, heard some enthusiastic comments from John Howard um, about the, the response of the Labor government to the global financial crisis. And he said, and I quote again, when the Prime Minister and the Treasurer tell you that the Australian, this is the Treasurer at the time, the member for Lilly, tell you that the Australian economy is doing better than most, they are right. Our debt to, debt to GDP ratio, the amount of money we owe to the strength of our economy, is still a lot better than in most countries. I think it's actually worth pausing, Deputy Speaker, on this question of public debt because um, we do hear a lot of scaremongering across the chamber there about uh, the levels of public debt in Australia. So let's, let's avoid the, the rhetoric on this one and look at some of the facts. Um, so where did the last Labor government leave us in terms of debt levels? When Labor left office, our debt per capita in Australia was the third lowest of any developed country in the world. When you look at our debt to GDP ratio, in August 2013, we were the lowest of any developed country bar Luxembourg. These scare campaigns really have no foundation in fact. Now, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't be vigilant, of course. Um, we're spending taxpayer funds here, and it's not, not that we don't need to be concerned about this. We can't take our eye off the ball. Um, but by global standards, Labor left uh, the budget of Australia in actually excellent shape. Um, for all we hear on the other side, it's worth thinking through what, uh, what we saw the coalition um, when, when they left office last time. Um, if you look at the ABS figures, which compare the full term of the Labor government with the full term of the last coalition government, we can see that average expenditure as a percent of GDP was 24.1 per cent under the coalition and 25.1 per cent for Labor, so just one percentage point higher under Labor. The end of period net debt for each of those governments, so the net debt at the, at the, basically at the, when those governments changed hands, as a percent of GDP was minus 3.8 per cent under the coalition and 11.7 11 per, 11 per cent under Labor. So for all we hear about concerns about fiscal uh, issues on the other side of the chamber, um, I think the facts actually show that Labor left the, the budget in excellent shape, and especially when we look back at um, the condition the budget was left in by the last coalition government. So we've talked a little bit about debt. Uh, I do want to spend a little bit of time on um, something that's perhaps a little bit more tangible to ordinary Australians and certainly something that's raised more frequently with my constituents in Hotham, and that is, of course, Deputy Speaker, the issue of jobs. 
We uh, talked a little bit about Joseph Stiglitz, Stiglitz. We talked about the IMF and we talked about John Howard and their comments. But another organisation that has recognised the excellence of Labor's package was the OECD, uh, noting that through the stimulus package, the Rudd government saved about 200,000 jobs. Um, it's, it's just it's a matter of fact that across the period of the Rudd government of the sorry of the last Labor government, almost a million jobs were created. Um, and Labor's un uh, the unemployment rate during that period was low, under 6 per cent. Now, let's just think about that in, in a global context. When we look uh, to Europe in particular, we see some terrible, terrible unemployment rates. So during that same period, the unemployment rate in Spain was 25.8 per cent, in France 10.8 per cent, in Portugal 15.4 per cent. Um, this is looking at the population as a whole. But, Deputy Speaker, when we look at young people, we see much more profound unemployment rates. Um, the unemployment rate in Spain was at 50 per cent, um, in Greece at 60 per cent. It's important to think through, especially when we look at this issue of youth unemployment, um, that these are not just uh, a moment in time issues. What we know um, from lots of studies that have been done, particularly in the US and the UK, is that for people who um, graduate into the labour market during a recession, um, that those people, especially on the lower end of the education scale, on the lower end of skills, um, will probably never recover the incomes that they would have made had they graduated into a normal economy. So what we'll see in, in Europe, unfortunately, in some of these countries is young people who will be forever disadvantaged just because of the timing in which they graduated into that labour market. Um, really, I mean, what chance do these young people have? It's really unfortunate. Um, but we didn't see this in Australia, and we should really reflect on that. We could have been in a situation where many more young people in our country left, uh, left their, their school life or left university um, with very few job prospects, and, and that's just not the case today. Um, I say it's not the case today, but I, I think it is opportune to just think about what we've seen in the last five months. Um, we saw you know, companies around Australia maintaining, uh, maintaining their, their bottom line and um, continuing to employ people throughout a global financial crisis, but many of these companies, Deputy Speaker, could not survive the first five months of the Abbott government. So we know, of course, that in that first five months, 50,000 Australian jobs have already been lost. In that five months, we've heard announcements from Holden, 2,900 jobs to go. Toyota, 2,500 jobs to go. The collapse of our automotive industry in the medium term, 250,000 jobs to go. That's people employed directly in the car industry and in components manufacturers. 1,000 jobs to go at Qantas, 500 at Electrux, 200 at Simplot, and 3,000 that are on the line at SPC Ardmona. This is a government that came into power trumpeting this great victory that we were going to have a million new jobs created. That's what was promised to the people who live in Hotham. Um, and we heard some pretty disturbing things raised uh, on this subject in the House yesterday. So I sat here in my seat looking at the Prime Minister and he got up and said, quote, sometimes jobs are lost. That was his reaction, Deputy Speaker. I just want to make a couple of points on this. It's true that government in general doesn't create jobs. Uh, most people in Australia are employed, employed in the private sector. But it's not good enough to say sometimes jobs are lost when so many of the incidents that have occurred in that last five months have been the direct consequence of government policy. And I'm referring there, of course, to the car industry. So we saw the Abbott government withdraw uh, $500 million worth of support. SPC, same, same situation, so a refusal to support SPC. Now those jobs are under threat. Uh, and of course, Rio, um, the incident in, in the Northern Territory. All these job losses directly relate to government decisions. So I understand if the other government wants to claim that they can't control everything, but these were directly related to, uh, to decisions that uh, to they or related governments made. They told the Australian people they would create a million jobs. Um, the people of Hotham didn't buy it. Neither do I. So I'll just conclude on a few points here, Deputy Speaker. I think the first is that Australia can be incredibly proud of its performance. It weathered a global financial crisis that buffeted economies around the world um, and did it in such a way that has been lauded by economists, um, by the International Monetary Fund and other organisations around the world. It was truly an extraordinary achievement. Um, unemployment and recession were by and large um, avoided, and I'm very grateful for that because it would have severely affected the lives of the people uh, who I represent in Hotham. Um, 
legis this legislation today has given us a chance to celebrate that record. And so, on behalf of the people I represent, I'd like to associate myself with that success. Thank you. Order. The question is that this bill be.